Give me a list of sins. <clears throat> Sins. Person? Mine. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Lying. Lying. Okay. Stealing. Yeah. Murder. Yeah. Uh, worshiping other gods. Yeah. Worshiping idols. Um, fornication. Um, let's see. Gluttony or lack of self-control in any way. Pride, greed. That's a pretty good list. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> that's a joke. What is, what's the definition of grumbling? Hmm. That's that's usually not listed in our lists of sins, right? What is the definition of grumbling? As we're turning to uh, Numbers 13. Not being satisfied. Is that coming to play? I don't think it's the same thing as lamenting. Good point. You know, yeah, being good point. sorrowful, not understanding, yearning, asking why, seeking God's clarity. Yeah. To me, that's different than grumbling. Good. Grumbling may be lack of contentment, lack of recognition of what God's done for me, complaining about God. It seems like a lot of our examples of grumbling. I'm in Exodus with Elena right now, and so of course the Israelites grumble a lot, and it's more complaining about God not providing, complaining about complaining against God. And I don't know if if grumbling would, like Toby said, be more specific to speaking against God's providence or God's protection of us. And the grumbling a lot of times also is <clears throat> complaints about what someone else has imposed upon you rather than recognizing what you, your responsibility in the situation. I think if people hear just negative and nothing's ever, you know, just stuff that it, it doesn't even matter if they, you know, grumble or complain about it. It's not, it's kind of a negative outlook and not seeing the good in anything. Mm. Well, keep your finger at number 13 uh, and flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Let's read, let me read 19 through 25 of Deuteronomy chapter 1. Starting where? 19 through 25. Then as the Lord our God commanded us, we set out from Horeb and went toward the hill country of the Amorites through all the vast and all that vast and dreadful wilderness that you have seen. And so we reached Kadesh Barnea. Then I said to you, you have reached the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, told you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Let me just pause you right there. So we go back. God, you know, told Abraham, leave Ur. Go to Canaan. And then he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you all this land. Told that to Abraham. Uh, he told it to Isaac. He told it to Jacob. Um and, of course, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And then, you know, God took them to Egypt. And 400 years, 400 years in captivity. And I always wonder why it was that God did that. Why, why did he create this numerous great nation 
in Egypt, <clears throat> in captivity, under bondage, under oppression, serious, serious oppression. Why did he do that? I don't really have an answer for that. But, so that's the history of this. And they all know that. They all know this history. Okay, go ahead and keep reading. Then all of you came to me and said, let us send men ahead to spy out the land for us and bring back a report about the route we are to take and the towns we'll come to. The idea seemed good to me, so I selected 12 of you, one man from each tribe. They left and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eskol and explored it. And taking with them some of the fruit of the land, they brought it down to us and reported, it is a good land that the Lord our God is giving us. Tell me your observations of this passage you just read. What problems do you see here? So far, the problems yet. Yeah. They all sound pretty good. <clears throat> they told them to go to this land and they came back and report and said, the land is good. Uh -huh. So um, in verse uh, 20 and 21, you keep reading. God is giving this to you. He's giving it. Okay? It's a gift from God. But verse 22, then all of you came to me and said, let us send some men ahead to spy out the land, blah, blah, blah. The idea seemed good to me. Now that, that was kind of a thought I had when, Okay, he had given them the land. Why are they feeling like they got to go check it out to see if it's okay? They're on a reconnaissance mission. Yeah. Why? Yeah. yeah. Why are they doing that? Um, and then he told them, he even kind of, you get a hint here, he says, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. <clears throat> why, why would they, why would they want to send spies into the land? Have that big a problem with them doing that? I don't know why. I mean, I mean, I see it. It wasn't God directly, but I also see this is a short passage that doesn't describe every word of the story. But my problem is my my not having a problem with it is that they they have to make plans because they like it's just normal human behavior to even if God wants me to do it, I've got to make some plans so that it happens. Yeah, and so we put back over to uh, uh, Numbers 13. Oh, by the way, look at look at Deuteronomy 1, verse 2. Deuteronomy 1, verse 2. It takes 11 days to go from Horeb, which is Mount Sinai. It's, it's another name for Mount Sinai. It takes 11 days to go from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea by the Mount Seir Road. So just to let you know, it's about, a, it's about 11, it's an 11 day trip, turns into 40 years. I just think it's interesting that Moses includes that. Yeah. Okay, uh, Numbers 13, um, Jess, you want to start reading uh, verse 21? We're going to go through 1425, so we've got a lot of stuff to cover, but start in verse 21. Okay. And go to where? 1425. I'm not stopping, though. Okay. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Reho to toward Labo Hamath. They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron, where Ahimash, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, live. That's what I chose you. Yeah, <laughs> Hebron had been built several years before Zon in Egypt. When they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron, and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them in the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. But the people who live there are powerful. The cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. 
The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, but we certainly can do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those who those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. People rebel. <clears throat> the night, that night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to just go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Okay, let's stop there for just a second. So, we think about this. Why did they doubt this promise of God? What What's happening here? What they see with their own eyes. Hmm. You know, but if it's interesting, you think about, okay, where they came from, they were under this tremendous oppression. They saw the ten signs from God, the ten plagues. They, they saw that. They saw the Red Sea part. They saw what God did. You know, uh, they had been several months in the, in the desert. He, they saw him provide manna for them every day. They saw him provide water for them. He provided quail until they got sick of it. <laughs> they had seen all of that stuff with their eyes. And so they get here. Why, did, why didn't they believe that, that he was going to give it to them? I feel like they're very physical people. I mean, we all are very physical people. We fear for hunger. We fear for our physical needs not being met. And yes, God, I mean... Because it does boggle my mind. When I read the account, I go, why are they doubting? They saw a great sea being divided in half, walking between water. Uh, why would they doubt what God can do? But they did over and over and over and over and over. And when you thought it was done, they just kept going. And so, I mean, part of me thinks that, you know, if they saw all these, these astounding miracles happen, and they doubted what God could do. Um, how could I even think that my faith is strong? Because they actually saw it and then doubted. Have you ever felt like that? It's like, man, if I could have just seen, you know, something. You, you, and, you, and you hear about the Israelites or when Jesus does miracles, you're just like, man, if I could have just seen him do, you know, something like that. And, I mean, it's obvious when you read the scripture that even people seeing that stuff, it doesn't give them... A strong faith. It doesn't give them a strong belief in, in God. There's something else. There's something deeper that's required. And so they, uh, so you've got these ten guys that come back and they start giving a bad report. I mean, even though they saw that it was amazing, I just thought it was interesting that phrase that they they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. Um, and so you've got these 10 and then you've got, you know, Joshua and Caleb that are trying to encourage you. No, we can do this. And obviously we know what, what happened. Um, someone else read starting in verse five of numbers 14. Moses and Aaron fell down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into the land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not be afraid of the people of the land, because he will devour them. 
Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? I will strike them down with the plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. And Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear about it. By your power, you brought these people up from among them. And they will tell the inhabitants of the land about it. They have already heard that you, Lord, are with those people and that you, Lord, have been seen faith, have been seen face to face, that your cloud stays over them, and that you go before them in a pillar of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. You said 14 Keep going. So 25. Oh. If you put all these people to death, leaving none alive, the nations who have heard this report about you will say, The Lord was not able to bring these people into the land he promised them on oath. So he slaughtered them in the wilderness. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punished the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, forgive the sin of these people, just as you have, been, you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on earth to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Since the Amalekites and the Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn back tomorrow and set out toward the desert along the route to the Red Sea. So going back. And what's interesting is the next day, the Israelites got up and said, oh man, we sinned. Let's go in and take it. And Moses said, don't do that. And, they said, nah. and he tried to talk them out of it. A bunch of them went in there and they got slaughtered. Um... Okay, what is it that made God angry? Why is God so upset? I'd say lack of faith. They, I mean, and what's crazy is they didn't really need a whole lot of faith. They, they had plenty of proof to see that they've been given everything on a silver platter, and all they really need to do is just go and have God and take it. That they did not exhibit that confidence. And, and he was frustrated with that to the point that he was ready to take him out. Well, is, a, is there a connection between lack of faith and grumbling? The Israelites, that's what they did. You know, they grumbled. They, they grumbled in Egypt. They grumbled when, even when Moses was bringing them out and got them to out of Egypt and right before the party of the Red Sea they were grumbling about you brought us here to die and you know those things so then they're grumbling in the wilderness when God's feeding them they're tired of that food and you know, so all along the way they're they're not not thankful for God's provision and mm -hmm. not humble and recognizing his provision mm -hmm. So you said lack of faith. You said they're not thankful, grateful. They're not humble. They trust goes along with faith. Yeah, it's certainly. It's like when God is with them. It's not like He's only speaking through Moses. I mean, they see God in the cloud yeah. by day, yeah. and they see Him in the fire by night, which has to be a miracle. Yeah. And he's telling them to do something. They're like, eh, I don't think. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just hard. It's, to it's hard to fathom. But we got to realize that that I mean, uh, we're no different than them. Yeah. So what can we what can we learn from that? 
Um, just going to read a passage out of his book about uh, out of this book about grumblers. It says grumbling by its nature will make us aggravated inside, and it typically inflames the attitudes of others as well. Thus, a chronic complainer leads a stress-filled life. Grumblers ignore the good in any circumstance that contains some feature that they dislike. I'm going to read that sentence again. Grumblers ignore the good in any circumstance that contains some feature that they dislike. Grumblers are blamers. They ignore the overall context of a particular incident to assign blame to somebody other than themselves. You were kind of mentioning that earlier. They never share in the blame because they are good or right and others are bad or wrong. Church leaders resign because of complainers. Ministers can be let go because of a group of complain. Uh, uh, excuse me, because a group of grumblers pers uh, persistent complaints. Congregations become divided because of murmuring. Good Christians are hurt by a grumbler's vicious accusations. Where grumblers run rampant, membership dwindles because many Christians do not want to be part of such a destructive environment. Grumbling is absolutely unchristian. So do you think he's kind of overstated his case here, or what do you think about that? I don't think so. Grumblers are toxic in any, in any environment, every environment, whether it be work, whether it be personal, it doesn't matter. They're toxic people. So it's hard to be around. I think attitude comes through a lot. I mean, I think it's it's prudent to be maybe wise is the better word. Maybe it's wise to be prudent. You, you need to. It's worthwhile to recognize what you're dealing with and and, and take the, the correct actions. You know, I'm kind of like Jessica. I don't have a problem with them going out and doing the recon mission to look at the to look at the land. If their motivation was to say, "Okay, let's figure out a plan on how we're going to do this," if their if their motivation was let's find a reason not to do it, then I'd have a problem with it. But we don't, we don't know what their motivation was there. Or to even ask, "Is this possible?" Yeah, if God already told them it's possible. Sure. So I think they were just making a plan somewhat, but they saw some challenges and they so quickly jumped on it. They lost their confidence. They they forgot that they had God behind them and that they would take over. But where where complaining becomes toxic and becomes an issue is when you can't figure out a way. You you got people that are just looking for the negative because they're happy looking at the negative. There's a lot of people out there like that. You know, it's it's funny in the Bible. I mean, just just seeing the Jewish people and their overall attitude. I mean. They're referred to as being a stiff, the stiff-necked people. You know, they're just bullheaded. They're going to get set in their ways. And by golly, this is the way it's going to be because they've already made up their mind how it's, how it's going to roll. And it's funny. I know I know Jewish people today. Yeah, I don't want to paint people with a wide with a wide brush, but every Jewish person that I know has a negative outlook, and I just wonder somehow it's become ingrained in their in their background to look at things like that. And that's something that I fight. I, I fight trying not to be negative all the time. I mean, I think I there, there are positive opportunities all over the place. And I think that's what God's frustrated with. I mean, he lays some things out on a silver fire for people. Mm -hmm. And people forget to take, to take advantage of and be confident in what he's given. So are we prone to ground one? And, you know, what kind of things... Do we grumble about? It's easy to fall into it. What kind of things do we grumble about? Grumble about being busy and tired. Um, Grumble about not getting our way, selfishness. Mm -hmm. Or the inequality of all. That would be my daughter's grumble. Fair. It's not fair. Hmm. 
Just that. take me. No. <laughs> yeah. It just didn't leave the answer you wanted. Hmm. Yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> I disagree, I think, with, with that assessment of uh, I'm okay with them sending the spies in. Um, Although I might have been one of the guys who hated to set some spies in there. <laughs> but but being able to look back on the story, you know, it's just like when God is telling them what to do, I want you to do this, I want you to do that, I want you to do that. Um, you know, I mean, it's almost like Peter taking his eyes off of Jesus when he was walking on the water. Like, man, he's walking on the water. And then he starts looking around, ooh, these waves and you know and when we start taking our eyes off of what God wants us to do and looking at the obstacles you know from a human through our human lenses that's when we start getting afraid we're like we can't do this um, yeah when we start you know and I understand all the I mean I'm all about making plans you know, I know Jesus talked, you know, talks about you know, consider before you do something. Yeah, you know, you're gonna be able to follow through. And I, I understand all that, but it just seems like you know, when you read in the old testament, just read about you know, like David, you know, uh, they don't even mention it this morning, but David took the census. God didn't tell him to take census, but he did, and he made God really mad when he did Yeah, so he's making like, oh, I need to find out how many fighting. You know, and so whenever we start thinking about things from our human standpoint and we negate the power of God in our lives to accomplish what he wants to accomplish in our lives, and we start saying we can't, I think that's what made God. Yeah. Do you think there's a difference in... This time period when God was directly talking to his people and teaching his people and, you know, directing things to happen to teach. And then us now where we're having to look back on his teaching and, and I don't get a word from the Lord. I get all of this and I've got to figure out what it means. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I've got to figure it out so much. I do. I think it's different. Because I don't live in that time period when things were like they are there. So I got to figure out what what is my Canaan? You know, what is my grumbling? What is my what is our direction? Yeah. You know? Well, like I gotta so send, I feel like I got to send a lot of spies out in my life to figure it out. <laughs> so in Hebrews, you know, I have no idea what's going on. It tells us, hey, these things are written so that you'll, yeah. you know, be able to look back and, and you'll you'll have an example. And so, yeah, you know, that's interesting that you that you bring up the difference in how God was, uh, you know, I mean, when when Miriam and Aaron started grumbling against Moses, God said, um, you know, in times past, I spoke through whatever He said, Moses. He sees my form, you know, kind of face to face. He doesn't see my face, but he sees my form. You know, why are you grumbling against him? You know, so obviously there's some different periods of time where God, how he talks to us. But I don't know that one is any better than another. I mean, that we have the scripture to look back and say, dude, this is what they did. And we see the whole story. Okay. Um you know, I have to believe that, that that is just as good or better than God saying, okay, do that. Okay, don't do that. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I know God gives us every everything we need for godliness. And that's in First Peter, I believe. So, anyways, it's easy to grumble. I've been a grumbler in the past. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still a grumbler. Uh, so, Let's be aware of that and realize that there's maybe a connection between grumbling and lack of gratitude, lack of humility, 
blaming others, um, and a lack of faith. Um, so let's, let's pray. Father, we do not want to be grumblers. We do not want to be people that do not believe in your might and your power and the way that you can work in our lives even today. Please help us not to view things through the lens of what we can do as humans, but help us to view it through the lens of what, what you can do. Uh, when the people wanted meat, Moses came to you and said, how in the world, we got 600,000 men here, I'm not counting women and children, how are you going to get enough meat? There's not enough cattle and sheep. And, and you said to him, is my arm too short that I can't do this? And then you brought the quail in so much that they couldn't stand it anymore. Um, help us to have that kind of faith, Father. Help us not to grumble. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.